Hey everyone, I have such a treat for you today. This story is so incredibly inspiring and from a mindset component, I know you guys are going to pick out so many gems today. And my guest is Jamie Mo Crazy uh, Crane. Her, she goes by Jamie Mo Crazy, Jamie Crane Mozzie. She's a professional freestyle skier based in Park City, Utah. And she had a near death accident in April of 2015. She's going to talk about, she had a very traumatic brain injury. She went into a natural coma. Um, doctors believe she never recover. They had her death certificate already written. Um, and through the unconditional support of her mother and her sister, she made a full reco recovery. So she's here fully recovered. Uh, she was paralyzed. Half her body was paralyzed. She lost her memory completely for six weeks. She shares like completely and was able to make a full recovery. So, wow. Like I love hearing the depths of wisdom that she's sharing from that experience. And I know you guys are going to, too. Um, if you want to find out more about her, she is a keynote speaker. She speaks on this often. She has a website. It's mo crazy strong.com. I'll put that in the links, um, in the, in the show notes and, um, on Instagram, she is Jamie mo crazy. That's J A M I E. I recommend giving her a follow and, um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get right into her story. Here is Jamie. Before we jump into the show, I am extremely honored to share with you the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Rep Provisions. And I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they're about. They are a regenerative agriculture company. They are a ranch. I have been to the ranch myself. Incredible. And if you aren't familiar with regenerative agriculture, it is my extreme honor to introduce you. So here's a few statistics of why regenerative agriculture is important before I get into what it is. First of all, the United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster than it's replenishing it right now. And this comes from our modern conventional agriculture practices that we've really just developed in the last several decades. The way we are raising cattle and the way we are growing these monocrops of plants is depleting our topsoil at astronomical rates. And I love the way Eric Perner, the founder uh, and owner of Rep Provisions, the rancher there at the ranch, I love how he puts this. He says that our planet is just a giant rock spinning in space with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil that supports all life on the planet. Every economy, every nation is sustained by this layer of topsoil. It's really important, right? We don't have any soil or quality soil, health goes down and then eventually life goes away. Right. So it's, it's so important. Um, right now we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year, because as it erodes from these conventional farming practices, it goes into the waterways and then goes into the ocean and we lose it. So it's not sustainable, obviously, and we have to regenerate the topsoil. And this is where regenerative agriculture comes in. And the way they raise their animals is supportive of regeneration of the topsoil. So you can listen to my podcast episode with Eric Perner if you want to learn more about exactly how they do it. It's so important. Now, from a health perspective, this is so cool. Um, Eric just shared with me that they had their meat lab tested at Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, let me share this with you real quick. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're in all foods. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So this is all foods have a certain ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now the ideal is one-to-one, -one, right? So we balance out that pro-inflammatory aspect of food, which is important. It triggers a lot of things in our body, but we balance it with the anti-inflammatory effect. On average, Americans are 10 to one. Their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 10 to one because honestly, we eat so much canola oil and so many processed foods and all the way up to 30 to one and higher. It's super inflammatory, causes heart disease, cancer, all disease. Um, grain fed meat is on average five to one ratio or worse. And what came back from Michigan state university is that rep provisions meat has a one to one omega six to omega three ratio, which is freaking huge. Um, so, so cool. I'm so glad they found that out. And by the way, just FYI, grain fed chicken has a 15 to one ratio and seed oils are the worst like canola. Um, so we mean all these industrial seed oils, 70 to one or worse. And they estimate that 25% of the calories in the American diet come from canola oil. No wonder there's so much disease. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy. So just wanted to share that with you guys. This is not only an amazing way to support the planet, but also your own health. 
Um, and they're giving you guys an awesome discount. It's one of the highest discounts they offer 15% off anything with code coach Tara. So I'll link that in the show notes, or you can go to repprovisions.com anytime and just use the coupon code coach Tara and get 15% off. Okay. So Jamie, the first question I wanted to ask you was, I was so curious as I was going through your story and I will, you know, I'll, we'll save the, the climax here for a little bit, but you know, just as I was looking through your, you know, your video footage and your website, and I was looking at how you were the first woman in the X games to do a double backflip. And I was like, damn, dude, I want in your mindset, like way before like the climax of this story, like what was it that first of all, like got you into such an extreme sport, but also to have like that level of confidence and drive to get to that point. Can you kind of share your mindset journey along this path of even getting started and then getting to be such a high level professional skier? That's a great question. So to get started, um, I actually, skiing comes down in my family. My grandmother Mm -hmm. lived in Sun Valley, Idaho. She was in some of the first ever Warren Miller ski movies. Oh, cool. She was, she was competing. She won the world cup downhill championships. And, um, my uncle, my great uncle actually went to the Olympics twice for skiing. So I started skiing when I was a year old. Wow. So I actually remember that as soon as I could walk. And as my mom will say, people would, would, would ask her once they saw my future and what I became, they'd be like, oh, you wanted her to start young. And my mom was like, no, I wanted to go play with my baby outside. I love skiing. Like yeah. what is more fun than taking her skiing? And so yeah. what we would do is like, I would just go in between her legs and she yeah. would like, hold on to me. We would just go for like a couple hours a day, not too long. Um, make sure I was warm the whole time. That's something that's big. Um, if anyone's listening and they are taking their kids skiing, um, two of my mom's secrets, um, and she now is a ski instructor at Park City for 10 years and a child specialist. And her secrets have stayed the same <laughs> from when I was a kid. Her secrets are make sure they have so much food. Like every time you go up the lift, give them a snack, give them some nuts, give them some grapes, give them some food every single run. Mm-hmm. Just keep them fueled up and make sure they're warm. A lot of times people forget about like around your wrists yeah. or your ankles and they'll let, let them get bare. And then that's when people, little kids get cold is that, that those part of their body. So make sure your kids are clothed properly and eat all the time and make sure you keep it short. They're not going to go out there for a whole day of skiing. They're just going to go out there for an hour or less maybe even, but keep it short and fun. So skiing has been a part of my life, my entire life. And then I just have to interject real quick and let you know that as you were describing all those tips for kids, I was taking them for myself because as embarrassing as as this is living in Utah for the last 20 years, I, I mean, I've only skied like twice, so you can imagine, you know, it's really bad. And I, I, I've been, it's been this bucket listy thing. I'm like, come on. I just, I just need to like get a ski instructor and I need to just get out there. So now I know I need really be really, really warm and I need snacks on every single run. <laughs> so thank and you. <laughs> we can talk about this later, but, um, you should, you should hire my mom. She works okay. her, and she's able to go to ev- every resort in Utah and she's a fabulous ski instructor. She gets booked up quick. Cause she's okay. So- I will definitely get her contact info after this. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, But so skiing was a part of my life, my whole life. And then I also was always very active. So since I was, uh, honestly, there's a story when I was nine months old, I climbed the drapes in our living room and I got stuck at the top and I yelled, mommy, helping me, mommy, helping me. And my mom was in the kitchen and she ran out and she saw her daughter at the top of the drapes and said, oh, my little Mo crazy. And then helped me down. And that was that name stuck forever. And so Jamie Mo crazy was born um, and developed. And then also that was the last time she helped me down because she was really into us getting through what we committed to. So if you committed to climbing up something, you also committed to climbing down it. Nice. Um, and so I was active and I wanted to do gymnastics. So I got really into gymnastics. And so then when I was nine years old, I actually won state championships 
in gymnastics and state championships in skiing back on the East Coast. And I was interviewed for the newspaper and I said my dream sports ambition was to combine skiing and gymnastics. And that's what um, slope style and half pipe are, park and pipe. It's the jumps and the rails and the half pipe and it's gymnastics on snow. So uh, when I started competing in that, I actually didn't start competing as a child because I didn't really understand it was an option. Um, When I was a child, it wasn't really even an option. There was no girls in X games. Um, It didn't really exist. And so (laughs) then when I found out, I started doing it. Now I look back, you mentioned I was the first woman to double flip at X games. And that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and what year was that? It was 2013. Wow. Um, we're coming on to 2022. So like nine ish years ago. Um, and now within that decade, every top girl who's on the professional circuit is doing much harder double flips, which is amazing. And I'm so proud of them. Um, it's the same kind of thing with like the four minute mile. Right. Nobody could run it. Nobody. And then all of a sudden everybody could run it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud and happy that that is where it went. Cause that's yeah. the direction progression supposed to happen. Um, but so yeah, back to, okay, well, hold on. Let me pause. This is the moment I went. To, so clearly you're a little bit of a daredevil. Naturally. I have a couple kids like you where it's like, they're like, let me see if I can jump off this tall, huge structure into this really dangerous place. You know, like, I'm like, holy crap. The fact that you even want to do that is amazing. <laughs> like, I'm kind of like, yeah, let's see if you can do it. I'm, I'm that kind of mom. Like I, I, I admire their courage for trying as long as it's not out of control. I have four kids by the way. Um, you know, I, I admire that. So I can see that you kind of have a little bit of that, like, I'm going to freaking try it. I'm going to see what I can do. I want to, you know, that kind of push, but like the first time you started doing this freestyle stuff, like what was that like? Like the first time you're trying to do these crazy tricks, like, were you always just, let me see if I can do it mentality or were you scared and you just had to push through it? Like, what was that transition into that? Like, I was often, let me see if you can do it, that mentality. Yeah. Um, and my mom actually has four kids as well. And she believed like you did um, that let them try it, you know, which actually, if you're allowed to do that, it makes you smart enough. You're not going to do things that you can't control, like right. your ability. Um, but so I, I did always want to try it. And so something that helped me a lot, because even if you have that mentality, you still get that adrenaline rush. You get butterflies in your stomach. Yeah. Like you're going to get a little bit antsy and nervous the first time you do tricks. That's just what's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. what I do is I, like we'll visualize and focus on what I'm going to do. So I'll think about it. Um, And then I like point my hand and I take three deep breaths at the top of the run. And then I drop in and I commit to taking action and going. And those three steps are some of the biggest steps for achieving anything you want to do in life and really being successful in any way. Because so first you have to decide where you want to go. So you have to visualize it. Then you have to start taking steps. Um, and some of that might be calming yourself down. That's eating correctly. That's working out. Um, so taking steps to build yourself to be ready for that. And then you have to commit to it. A lot of people know what we should be doing, but we don't commit to taking action. And so then you just are like, oh, I should, I should do this, but you don't actually mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. I'm kind of brutal. Sometimes I always say, if you're, if you have not actually done it yet, you don't know shit. (laughs) That's how I put it. It's like, you can read about it and you can listen on podcasts and you can learn everything there is to know about like, let's say getting in shape, but until you've actually done it, you don't know anything because you have not experienced it. You know, you think, you know, but like, there's a lot of learning that comes in action. So I love that you're about that. And thank you for sharing that. I love how you, you're like, you know, we know that breathing gets us in that parasympathetic response. We're not as crazy stressed out. You're going to have adrenaline in a moment like that. I can't even imagine like, seriously, girl, I like bow down to you. I'm like, I'm like scared just to go down the ski slope. I admit I have courage in, in some areas of life and going down a ski run with no sense of self-control is not one of those (laughs) brave areas. So I need to learn some skills, but seriously, that's, it's just amazing to me that you like have the mentality where it's like, I feel the freaking 
fear. I feel the adrenaline. I fear, feel the butterflies, but I'm a freaking do it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, connecting to that. Um, when I was doing my first double backflip at X games, I had done double backflips on snow. I had gone at park city, yeah. the Olympic training park. So you slide down plastic and you flip into a pool and I had done a thousand of them. So I was ready. I had done them on the trampoline, done them on the water ramps, done them on snow. And then for my first round, when I got to X games, I set the trick too hard. And so I over rotated and slid out and I didn't land it. And so then when I was going up the lift, you know, no one else was doing double flips at the time. And I easily could have not done it the second run. So I had to think about what my own personal best was, what I could truly do. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I realized that like the person who was getting in my way was myself. I didn't trust that I could do the trick. So I set it too hard because I was nervous. So I needed to just step away and let myself, my body, my auto tuning, let it perform the way it could perform. And then I landed it. So I did it. So that was one wow. of the biggest life lessons is sometimes Quite often, actually, we're standing in our own way and we need to just step aside and let ourselves do what we can do. I love that message so much. It's funny timing because I was just writing um, a personal development program for my clients and I was writing about belief. It was like, it's the second to the last day we talk about belief. And um, I had another podcast guest who was able to get over a, a 10 year long drug addiction, like very severe, you know, heroin, meth, the full bit. And he had tried so many times he had tried to, you know, he was like, I wanted to, wanted to, wanted to, but he was like, it was not until I believed that I definitely was going to that it happened. And I hear that with you. Cause like you had that relationship with yourself, you know, you can land a double backflip. You've done a million times. I love how you're, you're, um, sharing that. It's like that achievement was achieved way before the actual achievement. You, you achieved the double backflip a million times, just not in the X game. So it was like, you had to recenter yourself and have this like moment with yourself of like, girl, you know, you can do this. You do this all the time. It's just the same thing that you do all the time, you know? So thank you for sharing that. It's so key that, that belief, that level, that moment we have with ourselves, it's so easy to get into fear and anxiety and pressure. And it's like coming back into center, breathing, knowing inside yourself, like, you know, you got this. That's so freaking valuable. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. So can we get to the part of the story where everything started to change from here? So you're on top of the world. You've just set this amazing record at the X games. You're like leading the way in this sport. Like you're on, on top of the freaking mountain. And can you share what happens next? Yes. Well, I love how you said you're on top of the mountain because I was, I was climbing up the mountain of life. I wasn't quite at the tippy tippy top, but I was pretty darn high up there when I got caught in a metaphorical avalanche that slid me down to the bottom of the mountain. My life changed in the blink of an eye when I was competing at world tour finals in Whistler, Canada on April 11th, 2015. And that was actually my sister Jeannie's first world tour finals that she made for half pipe on her own. And we were so excited for the award ceremony where everyone dresses up and you get to have all these fun activities. And so anyways, we were so excited, but on that competition day, it was slope style. So I was the only one competing and Jeannie was at the top of the run. She gave me a hug and she watched me drop in for my run and I hit the first couple features and then I took off on the jump that I was doing a double flat seven, um, which is an off axis double backflip and I landed it, but I caught an edge and I hit my head onto the snow and my brain started bleeding in eight spots. Wow. And from the top of the run, Jeannie couldn't see my landing, but she saw that I didn't hit the next jump. She didn't think that much of it because in, in freestyle, you fall a lot. And she was like, oh, Jamie fell. And then she heard the radio, the ski patrol radio crackle to life. We need all hands on deck and a helicopter on standby. Oh, man. And that's when she put on her skis and skied down. And then she saw me convulsing. I was oh. doing blood and my eyes were rolled back in my head. Wow. Wow. Whew. So where does it, where does your journey take you from there? Were you, do you remember any, you don't remember this, do you? 
that no, moment? I, I don't remember the day that I crashed. Wow. I went straight into a natural coma. It was not medically induced, um, which wow. means it was even more severe. Um, and when I was airlifted to Vancouver General Hospital, my first responders actually wrote my fatality report because my statistics for recovery were so low. Going down on the sled to get to the helicopter, they had to pump air for me. I was not breathing on my own. Um, and then when I arrived in Vancouver, I actually became the first patient in North America to receive an oxygen and pressure analyzing brain bolt that they had learned about in Cambridge, England prior um, and had come back and were waiting on someone to test it out on. And I was young before my accident. I was incredibly healthy and I had very low um, statistics for survival. So they figured, let's give it a shot. And we did. Um, and like you mentioned, I don't remember any of this stuff, but what that means is a pressure analyzing is if your brain's swollen, so they know how to take out your skull, they've used that a lot, but the oxygen as well means that they were testing out your oxygen level in your brain from directly your brain instead of your finger. And so one day when I was in the coma, my finger said that I was fine, um, the level of oxygen, and my brain said that I was one point away from permanent brain damage. Wow. So they had to increase the oxygen level pumping to my brain. Um, and so the, there's so much in my recovery that was pretty remarkable. There is that. And then the fact that my mom arrived within 24 hours to the hospital, my whole family came, my whole immediate family. So my four sisters um, and my mom and my dad. And um, when my mom arrived, she had higher education in um, psychology, early childhood brain development, um, early childhood education. And so she started running a program for my healing. She arrived as a caregiver with lots of training, which is something that's interesting because a mo like you become a caregiver, a family caregiver for TBI instantly. And you don't have any training or any knowledge about what you can do. Right. Um, yet my mom, because of her education and who she is, would do things like she was talking when I was on the feeding tube to the doctors and was like, I want fish oil in her feeding tube. I want probiotics in her feeding tube. So she was saying what things to add. And those two things have been researched and studied. And as long as they've gone through testing and everything, the doctors will add that, but they won't add it unless they're asked. And so she would ask that. And then some other things, like when I was just lying there, she immediately started moving my body. As soon as she found out that I had no torn ligaments or broken bones and it was safe to do that, she never did anything before clarifying that it was the safe thing to do. Um, but she would start to move me like you move your babies. And so the, my range of motion was still happening. I wasn't just stagnant for mm -hmm. months, like lying. Right. I stayed moving and um, then she continued when I was taking, like by taking me outside when I was in the wheelchair, um, we started going outside all the time. And then when I was beginning to recover, she would tape down my strong hand because I was paralyzed on half my body. So I had to use my weak hand and with an understanding of neuroplasticity. Now we know that it's possible to recreate the synaptic connections in your brain and recreate your brain pathways. 20 years ago, they didn't think it was possible. Now we know it is possible for anybody to create new brain pathways because of the habits that they have. And after a brain injury, if you think about it, a brain injury, your entire brain gets covered in snow. I love snow, but this is a little bit of a challenging snow story. So your, all your brain pathways are covered with snow. That's a brain injury. And we don't have big plows that can just open it up. You have to walk through each path with snow up to your neck. As hard it is it is to walk through a path with snow up to your neck is how hard it is to do those things at the beginning. And then the more times you walk that path and you create that habit and you walk it back and forth, back and forth, it'll get easy and the snow will pack down and you're oh. just over it. 
I love analogies. That is so good. So, so good. Anybody who's changed a pattern in their life knows exactly how that is. And I even saw, like, as you were describing that, like, and then, and then uh, it falls and it crashes in one part and you have to like dig through that again. Cause you're like, dang it. I thought I was already here, but nope, let's yeah. keep going. You know, like that's such a great analogy. Wow. And also just have to say about your mom, I'm, I'm sure like everyone listening is probably thinking the same thing. Like uh, what an amazing woman, like what, and, and how beautiful it was that she was so prepared for something like that, you know, but wow. Like <laughs> just, it, it's, it's so beautiful to hear like the love in your family and the support that you had during that time, you know, and that your mom was like educated enough to be able to help you and, and be your advocate in that space. And that, that hospital just happened to have just the thing that you needed in that area of the world that you happened to be in at that time when it happened, it's just, it's beautiful. Um, how long were you in the coma? I was in the coma for 10 days. Wow. In the movies, they show people like waking up and they are kind of alert. No, waking up from a coma means that you open your eyes uh, on command. You could open them for 10 minutes and that's waking up from a coma. Mm. So then I had serious amnesia. So absolutely no memory for an additional six weeks. Nothing. Nothing. Wow. Nothing day to day. And I was in hospitals. I, I was on a feeding tube. So I was out of the coma, but I was far from <laughs> like, um, I'm back everybody. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so that happened and, and really quick going back to um, how you mentioned the support for my mom um, and my family. That is why my sister, Jeannie, my mom, um, Grace, and I, we are co-founders of Mo Crazy Strong, which is our resilience company. And we do a lot of education specifically for caregivers. So that's something that my mom really specializes in. And we were at a conference in Salt Lake City, a critical care conference last week, um, but teaching um, person-centered practices and the healing from TBI. So, cause she did, she had that background to be able to help me. So now we're trying to raise more awareness because um, caregivers in general, and especially family caregivers in general, and especially TBI family caregivers are such an untapped group of people that just are lost and, yeah. and confused. And they don't understand as a caregiver that they need to take care of themselves as well. And so we, we tried to do a lot um, in relation to that. Wow. That is absolutely amazing. Um, so you're in this, so you're coming out of this coma, you have no memory. You're, you know, you're getting to this point where you're starting to try to use the side of your body that you can't use at all. How, like, what was that process like? Like, um, you know, what insights could you share with like, were you frustrated? Did you just want to cry all the time? Like what, what was that process like going from, barely being able to operate to like, clearly like you're fully, you know, operating now, like what walk us through that journey? Yeah, it, it was a long journey. So it was yeah. a five year journey. Wow. <laughs> Which a lot of people in brain injury think is actually pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so at the beginning in the hospital, um, when my memory was coming back, but I didn't have it all. I was really happy. I was like an intoxicated 10 year old. I was just like super giggly, happy. I would go around and say hi to everybody. And I did not believe that I was in a hospital. I actually, the nurses, when they were trying to get ready to let me go, would come in and ask me where I was. Um, and they expected me to say a hospital. And I would tell them that I was in a movie about a hospital mm -hmm. because old people and sick people went to a hospital. I wasn't old and I wasn't sick. I had pictures all around my room. I even had a hammock in my room. And then I had the touchdown when they hit me with the needles, it didn't hurt. So obviously it was a prop. Wow. How do we tell her it's because she's paralyzed. Um, so, and this is a little bit I think you were talking about believing you could recover, believing. I firmly believed that my life was fine and that I was, wow. which is wow. really powerful. And then at the same time, something that has to go hand in hand is that since I had been an athlete my whole life, I was open to being coached. 
because you yeah. need to believe you can recover. You need to believe there's a future. But if I just believed that I was okay and I was indignant when people tried to help me, indignant to do the therapy, I didn't want to because I didn't need to do that. That would be just as bad as if I didn't believe I could recover. Oof. So you need to have the belief. And then you also need to be open to being coached. Mm -hmm. And something I share a lot about is you need to really focus on your own personal best. So before my accident, I thought I knew that my own personal best was like being the best. <laughs> um, and then after my accident, I really understood the full meaning of it because my mom raised me with that mantra and I'd heard it my whole life and it helped me become the best in skiing. And then when I was recovering, it helped me realize that my own personal best was walking upstairs. It was swallowing a glass of water. It was passing Rosetta Stone in English. My own personal best had changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, if, we, if our own personal best for something is not what society thinks is amazing, you don't actually perform at your own personal best. Mm. You kind of half asset you you yeah. you're a little bit weaker but if you perform at your own personal best for everything then your own personal best is just going to grow and you perform at your own personal best as you set attainable goals so instead of thinking about your huge growth goals that you have in mind like for me from the very beginning when my mind came back I wanted to go back to skiing and at that time when I wanted to I couldn't walk upstairs by myself so that was a huge gap so instead of focusing on like getting back to skiing, I focused on setting attainable goals that helped me reach that, like walking up the stairs every day. Those were my attainable goals. And then I started going farther and farther and then faster. And then I started timing myself. Wow. Um, so by the time I left the hospital, I could run up 12 flights of stairs in three minutes and 26 seconds. And I still know that time because it, it meant so much to me. Wow. So those are attainable goals, goals you know you can accomplish every day that help push you towards your growth goals. Oh, girl, I can see why you hit the level that you did in your sport. That that is the mentality of a champion right there is 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 honoring and pushing through those baby steps and, and game you gamified it. You gamified your recovery. You were like, I'm going to get a personal best on the stairs. I, like what a positive attitude on it. Right. Because you're exactly right. There's so many of us. It's like. Oh, I'm, I'm just not on the ski. So, so like you, you could have just wallowed in that misery and I'm not there. I'm here. This all sucks. I mean, maybe you had some moments like that. No one would blame you, you know, but like being able to get into those spaces of seeing the positive that's right in front of me right now, what's good about right now, what can be good about right now, what can be exciting about this step, you know, and enjoying that process is how you get there. So thank you for sharing that. And I just last have to say, I freaking love athletes. I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to coach a, a few, um, ex NFL players on, on, uh, nutrition. And I tell it, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you know why those were my favorite clients? Just kidding. They were my, just kidding clients. They weren't my favorite clients. But one thing I noticed about them is that they were so easy. <laughs> they were so easy to coach. They had been coached for so long that they were so easy. It was just listen and apply, listen, apply. It doesn't matter if I'm going to my mom's house or my friend's house or whatever. Like this is what I'm freaking doing right now. And that ability to be coached, it, it got that, like, they just had crazy success, like crazy fast on, on with nutrition because they had that ability to be coached and apply what they were being taught. Right. So it's a super skill and it, it, definitely served you here. Um, okay. So five years, five years of going through this process, you know, I think one of the things that is tough for people and you kind of mentioned it is not being able to have the goal, the big goal that I want, like right now, and, and then kind of sitting on our hands, you know, and you talked about taking these baby steps, but I'm wondering, like, did you have moments where you were like, <laughs> just depressed and sad that you had to work through and mindset your way out of them, you know, or are you just like superhuman positive all the time? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because as you were, as you were talking, you're like, maybe you have these moments. I just wanted to share that. Yes. I, I had a lot of those moments and I am a pretty positive person and I still have those moments yeah. <laughs> and I think that's really important to recognize that it's okay to have those moments yeah. 
And when I was recovering from the TBI, two things happened. One, your emotions are in your brain. And so they got rattled. And then two, my life had changed. My identity was a professional skier. That's what I did around. That's where all my friends were. And then all of a sudden I had to find a new identity. So it wasn't like, oh, I can't accomplish these goals. It was, I don't know what goals to set. I don't know where to go. And so that first winter, is actually when I felt the most lost because that's when I began to realize like up until that first winter, I thought I was going to go back to competing. I kind of equivalented my brain injury with like a torn ACL. People tear their ACLs and skiing all the time. I was like, I'll just take this year off and then I'll go back. And then I realized with having to relearn how to walk and ride a bike, I would also have to relearn every single skiing trick that I knew. And when you learn tricks, you fall. And I, I had two right. things. One, I realized I loved life and I didn't want to put my life at risk. I did not think that competing in skiing and performing at that level was worth putting my right. life at risk. Right. And if I put my life at risk, I put all the people who had supported me, all that faith, all that trust, I put that all at risk. And I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. I honestly thought that if I went back to competing and I died, it would ruin my family <laughs> and I couldn't ruin my family. Mm. And um, so I, I didn't want to do that, but that's when I started going to psychotherapy. Um, Cause I did, uh, I started going three days a week because I was having some huge mental challenges and huge mental blocks And I was feeling so frustrated. And I think one of the things that's important, and it's the same thing as like being coached, if you're whatever you're having blocks with in life, if you find someone to help support you through it, which is what a psychotherapist does, it's what you do with nutrition, it's what people do. So find somebody who can help support you. um, That can be so helpful, because the amount Mm -hmm. of money you're putting out to get that support is, is worth it. Um, in my opinion. So I, I started going to psychotherapy and I, I went to therapy for three years. Nice. Um, and now I do believe that I'm overall a very confident, happy person. I feel like I'm much more settled. Like when I have struggles, I know how to let them off, you know, shake it up. Yeah. You have the tools, I was, right. I was that Taylor Swift song, well, <laughs> shake it up. Um, you gotta just do that. You gotta shake it off. Yeah. Um, but I still have bad days. And I think one of the biggest lessons I learned through this whole process is it's okay to have bad days. Um, And also to think about your language, what you're saying to other people and what you're saying to yourself. Yeah. Because when I left the hospital coming from being a strong athletic person my whole life, all of a sudden I couldn't walk for more than five minutes without taking a break. And I wanted to go hiking in Park City and I would go on like the easier trails, but I would need to take so many breaks. And I'd always go with my friends or family. I could never do anything by myself at that time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ever left alone. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the very beginning, I wasn't even left alone in the bathroom. Like someone had to stand there because I would get lost and I would forget what was happening. Um, But anyways, back to, so I would go for the walk and I kept being like, I need a break. And it was so humiliating and depressing for me to say, I need a break all the time. And my mom was like, well, think about your language choice that you're, you're using. This is her psychology, master's in psychology coming in. She was like, why don't you say, let's look at the view because we're in park city and there's always, and I love that. So when I was feeling tired and I wanted to stop, because that was my goal to rest my body. I'd say, Hey guys, let's look at the view. And then we'd stop and look at the view and I'd get to rest my body. And it felt so much better. And now it's become a metaphor for everything in life. So when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed and just going, take a break, stop, look at the view before you keep going. I love that so much, man. Your mom sounds awesome. I was also thinking like, 
uh, what you talked about with your identity, um, is so important. I hope, I, I don't know if you already have, but I hope you get connected with the NFL and guys that are coming out of the league. Cause I know that, that, you know, tra- traumatic brain injury is a huge, huge issue, um, in, in the NFL. And it's this double, I feel like it's a triple whammy in a lot of ways for athletes that go through something like you did, which is the super severe <laughs> case of that, or just coming out of your, you know, your sport or whatever, there's a loss of identity and there's a loss of us in extreme loss of physical activity, sunlight, getting all those endorphins all the time, the biochemical stuff of just like having your dopamine and adrenaline through the roof and getting in those mood boosts from that. All of a sudden you're not getting that. And, and, and just trying to like settle your, your, you've been the most competitive driven person in the freaking world. And now you don't have that. So you're like, it's just, it's, it's a lot to manage at once. And it's, it's common. I've even, you know, I've ha- have a friend who she was like a big time fitness competitor and then she got married and had a baby and like, that's all gone now. And she's like, wow. Like she was kind of famous in her country that she was from. And she's like, it's like an identity reset. Like I'm not that chick anymore. I'm just, I'm like a, a mom at home, like, whoa, you know, and going through like an identity shift like that, even when you don't really realize you had your identity wrapped up into something, but now all of a sudden you do, I love that you gave the counsel to go get help because I I always tell my clients, I'm like, they're called blind spots for a reason. Like you can't even identify, you don't know what it is that's causing you to feel down and sad. Like it, just like your mom's example with the view thing, like, wow, what, what a help that was to have that, you know? So having somebody at some outside hands, especially some highly trained ones come in and help us through these things. It's such a huge investment in our future. Like your shake it off tool that you have, or let's look at the view. Like those all came from other people, you know, and you, I mean, obviously have your own seat at the table here. You're freaking badass, but like, it's so beautiful that I hear in your messages all throughout this is like, let other people bring their gifts to the table too, and help you through whatever it is that you're going through. Even when you were achieving at the highest, you, you had coaches, you had gymnastics coaches, you had ski coaches, you had your mom, you had, you know, so I love that you're kind of intertwining that it's, you don't build greatness just all by yourself message into this. Yeah. I sometimes joke that I'm just the Barbie. <laughs> just me and do whatever. Um, Cause I, and I'm glad that you noticed that because I do get a lot of attention and credit for what I've accomplished. And I, I mean, some of it probably came from me, but I feel like I had so much support the whole time from so many different people. It was just listening to them. And that's something that I've noticed that a lot of people oh. don't do. Um, they, they get support and it is a little bit tricky because everybody can think that they want to give you support and every support, even if it's a good support for someone else might not be the right support for you. Yeah. So right. You need to find like your team members that really benefit you and what you're doing and push it. Um, which is why for Mo Crazy Strong, I I feel so good working with Jeannie and Grace, my mom. Um, because and then we have a lot of other team members and we've gone through people and we've worked and and I'm not gonna get all into that, but there it's like it's hard to make sure that the people you're surrounding yourself with are always pushing you and always bettering you and bringing their skills. And they have the right skills to be bringing to the table. You know, you might find someone who their skills that they're bringing are not really what you need. And so being able to find what's the best fit for you, but yeah, I definitely don't think that you can do. I personally don't think that you can do anything by yourself. I, I think that, everyone's support in different ways. Everyone has different kinds of support that allow them to reach success. Yeah. I love that. And I love your message of like, uh, I have seen a, f- a couple of things happen. One is people get like married to like one therapist, not ma- literally married, but you know what I'm saying? They get, uh, you know, we have one therapist and like, this is the only person that's ever going to help me ever. And it, it, that's great. If that person's helped you, um, I see this weird, like, I don't want to cheat on my therapist vibe. And I'm like, what? Like <laughs> you can have other, uh, you know, coaches or workshops or seminars or friends, or, you know, that speak to you as well. And then sometimes people go this other route where they hire a coach one time, didn't work. They're never doing it again, you know? And it's like, Oh, it's okay. There's, there's lots of different, uh, 
v- tribes. There's lots of different vibes yeah. of help, you know? And so it's like, it's a little journey. It's a little journey. And when you, you know, when something's helping you or not, you know, when it's helping you, <laughs> it's, it doesn't take long to figure out. <laughs> yeah. And speaking about knowing if something's helping you, something I think that's very important is to listen to your gut. Yes. Listen to, trust your gut. Yeah. So if you have like some weird feelings about somebody, listen to it. You know, it, it might, there might be a reason that you'll see in years down the road or, you know, but listen to your gut. And if it just feels like it's the right thing, it is the right thing. Even if that's not what society thinks of you. And so an example of this is I was actually interviewed in e-magazine as a resilience expert with my be your own personal best motto, talking about how Simone Biles withdrew from the Olympics because that was her own personal best decision to make at that time. And that's not what society wanted. It's not what the society expected. So it's really hard to trust your gut when it's going against what you think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. However, if it's what you feel is the right decision, you, you need to trust yourself. Yeah. When it's going against whatever you think everybody else thinks you should do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Really, really valuable insight. I like to say that my intuition is my superpower and we all have it. (laughs) So if you want to just tap into it, you just can start listening to it and just watch. (laughs) And yeah, thank you for that. I do want you to tell us a little bit more about Mo Crazy Strong. So by the way, guys, it's mocrazystrong.com and also on Instagram, you can, it's M-O Crazy Strong. Can you tell us a little bit more about Mo Crazy Strong? Yeah, so Mo Crazy Strong is our resilience company. And actually, I had a email from our attorney today that it's one more step closer to being officially the nonprofit. Um, and so it's in the works of that. Um, and what we do is I do motivational keynote speaking. Um, so I go to different corporate events and I talk to audiences about overcoming trauma and climbing an alternative peak, which everyone right now got hit by COVID. And as we're recovering, a lot of the things we took for granted changed. Like we have to understand how to climb an alternative peak. And my lived experience, I can share that with people so that they can take some ideas from me and do a better job climbing their alternative peaks after COVID. Um, So I'm a keynote speaker. And then also we do workshops and resilience programs. Um, That's kind of what my mom runs. And some of them we do to organizations. And sometimes we do that specifically to TBI specific stuff. Um, So she has a couple of things that aren't ready to be disclosed yet, but she's been working on um, for Utah TBI. Um, We're both board members of the Utah Brain Injury Council. So we work on changing protocols and awareness and like, so we're very involved in that. And then um, Jeannie is working as the event planner. So this winter actually coming up on March we arrive on March 17th and then you leave on Sunday, March 20th. And it's going to be an all inclusive ski and yoga event called Nama ski at park city. And it's going to be at park city mountain resort. Mm -hmm. And it's a mindset resilience program. And um, it will help fund the projects that we do specifically for TBI. Cause it's, Oh my gosh. So it's going to be very high level luxury retreat. We're going to be staying at an amazing hotel. There's going to be a spa inclusion, yoga inclusion, and we're going to go to different conf- a conference room and have some mindset stuff. And wow. we're actually Kendra jewelry is coming one day. So you can design your own necklace with the um, stones. You can pick out your own stone. So it's custom. So it's going to be an amazing experience. Cool. And those are going to act as fundraisers for our nonprofit work. That is so awesome. How do, how can people find out about that event? Is it on milcrazystrong.com yet? Or is that where they should go? Not sure. I'm not sure when this is going to be aired because as it is right now, we're working with the website team, um, make the event page. Okay. Uh, And so there is, you can see on mocrazystrong, um, and it will be that you can click the link on mocrazystrong and go to a page and sign up there. Um, very hopefully any, any day now, um, that will happen. And then if 
when this airs. So look on Mo Crazy Strong or contact um, at Mo Crazy Strong, M O C R A Z Y S T R O N G at gmail.com. So if you if you have questions, go co- contact us. Awesome. Um, but you should be able to find it on the website. That sounds amazing. And I love hearing that you guys are involved on the board for traumatic brain injuries and you guys are like really creating impact with what you're doing here. So awesome. Um, girl. Wow. (laughs) I'm just sitting here watching you and I'm like, you're freaking amazing. Like you, you're the, the recovery that you've made from such a severe injury is so inspiring, but not only that, but like what you're doing with it, you know, and the, the, the lessons that you learned, through the hardship you're helping bring, you're like, you know, it's like, I see that image of somebody like reaching down the mountain and pulling somebody up with them. It's like, come on, let, you're good. Let's go. <laughs> you got this, you know, and it's just so beautiful. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh, before we finish, you also have some good news. Cause I saw it in your bio, something that happened in April of this year. Yes. So <laughs> April 11th, like I mentioned is my injury day. Um, which now has become my alive to thrive day because I celebrate it every year. And April 11th is, well, well, let's go back five years. So five years ago, April 11th was my best friend Reggie's birthday. And I actually, three years after my accident, stayed in Salt Lake to have a joint birthday party with him. And then he became my boyfriend for some years. And then on April 11th, 2021, we climbed to the top of one of the peaks in the big Cottonwood Canyons in Salt Lake City. So we climbed up, we were ski touring up to the top and still with his split board on, um, because he's a snowboarder. So he had his split board, I had my skis on, he knelt to the ground. We had a photographer because it was my life to thrive day. And he knelt to the ground and it goes, hey. And I, I look over and he was like, I, I know I want to spend the rest of my life with you when you marry me. And I looked at him and I was just like, Oh, Oh, that's so awesome. Are there pictures on your Instagram of that? There are. I'm going to go find it. (laughs) You can get pictures, but this is my ring. Oh, congrats girl. Oh, it's beautiful. And and it has mountains on it. So this, (sighs) this really quick, this ring is very custom. Um, I wanted it to be gold and I wanted it to have, it has a pink sapphire in the middle and then four little diamonds and two medium sized diamonds. Um, and the wedding, the, the d- ring designer, we had a ring designer who works in park city and she did an amazing job, but she was like, I don't know if she's going to want a ring- pink ring for her whole life. And Reggie was like, yes, she does. And then my little sister who my mom and my sister were helping because Reggie's fantastic. He's an operational supervisor, engineer. He's really smart. He ha- his management has employees working for him. He's not a ring designer and he knows he's not a ring designer. So he found the correct people to design the ring, <laughs> my mom and my sister. And they were like, no, we're hiring you to design the ring that we want. And we know that Jamie wants this in her <laughs> I do. I actually, <laughs> I, I, have, love I have it. nothing to do with it and it's perfect. It's, it's exactly what I want. I love how meaningful that is girl. I'm so happy for you and you guys are getting married next year. Congratulations. I love that. You call it your alive, alive to thrive, alive to thrive, alive to thrive alive. day. Yes. Alive the gratitude. Thrive. And then really quick, um, we are getting married actually we're getting married in Whistler at the top of the mountain. Oh in my Whistler. Gosh. So when we walk down, when I walk down the aisle, you're going to be able to see in the background, the run that almost took my life. Wow, girl. That is so day. beautiful. What a happy ending. Oh my God. And actually kind of like a happy beginning. Cause there's just so much more goodness to come. Yeah. It's just like a happy little circle. Yeah. A little chapter of like that portion. Then there's more things that are going to come. So Yeah. It's a girl. And cause who knows if you guys even would have gotten married if you hadn't reached out. Cause it was your like alive to thrive day and his birthday and all that stuff. So it's just so beautiful how life just kind of comes together in, in our favor. Always. If we choose to honor it and experience it and see it that way and keep pushing forward and climb that alternative mountain, as you said, you know, and that girl, there's so much goodness coming. You haven't even turned 30 yet. Yeah, there's so much goodness coming from you. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. 
Um, guys, again, if you want to find her on Instagram, it's mo crazy strong, or just go to her website, mo crazy and we'll make sure that's linked up in all the show notes on YouTube and all the audio platforms. Jamie, thank you again. It was so awesome to meet you. I will be meeting your mom soon. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> and just really quickly, the Instagram is actually back to Jamie Mo crazy. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. It thank just, you. It was Jamie Mo crazy. And then I changed to Mo crazy strong and now it's back. Okay. To- thank you for letting me know that. So guys, the Jamie is J A M I E. So Jamie. Yeah. M-O-C-A-Y. Oh, crazy. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Thanks so much. Bye.